All right. Praise the Lord. Throwing a little bit of a curveball at you guys this year, but you guys take preaching so well, we figured you might want a little bit more. So, all right. Take your Bibles and go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Now, you've probably already heard verse 7 quoted a couple times between our opening video from orientation and and of course it's one of your memory verses but I want to read the passage here and maybe pull a couple things out to get us started going down um, the road here this week start in verse number one the Bible says therefore seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy we faint not but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to those that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And of course, here's our text for this week. It is, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of of us. Now, I'd like to really just kind of clarify when we talk about the theme of this week being spiritual treasure that I, I want to just I want to un- want you to understand that it's not going to be this series of things where if you have this and this and this and this in your life, then that's how you know that you're saved. Right? We understand that when we get saved and we ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into our hearts and save us, that the Holy Spirit then takes residency up inside of our bodies. Okay, and now I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me, and I believe that the Holy Spirit and God the Father and God the Son, those three are one, and I have Jesus Christ living inside of me. So the doctrinal implications of this verse are pretty clear. I have, I have God in me. I have the Lord Jesus Christ taking residency up in my body, and the Bible calls that a great treasure. But there's an illustration in the Bible I'd like to bring to your remembrance, maybe, and that's over in Joshua chapter 17. Joshua chapter 17, you don't have to turn there, just listen, (laughs) right? The children of Joseph, they come up to Joshua and they say, hey, Joshua, you've given us all this land and, and, and it's ours now, right? They've moved into the land, they've possessed the land, right? And he says, but it's too narrow for us. We're we're growing and we're a great people and we need some more room. And Joshua answers them and he says, hey, if you're so great, why don't you get up into the wooded country and into the Mount Ephraim and why don't you start cutting some trees down, right? The illustration is simple. What the illustration is is that they possessed everything that they needed in that land, but they were not occupying all the land in which they had possession of. So the thing I want to tell you tonight is, guess what? You have as much of Jesus Christ residing inside of you tonight as you're ever going to get on the face of the planet while you're alive. You understand? There's no more Jesus Christ that can fit inside of your body than what's in there right now. But the issue that we have sometimes is that we have this great treasure in us, but we live like we're spiritually broke. Right? We have possession of something so wonderful and so magnificent and of so great value, but yet we live like we're in rags spiritually, right? And so I want to make sure that we clarify that before we go too much further, right? And so there's some proof of whether or not I have some treasure. There's a proof whether or not, listen, and it's not proof that I'm saved. It's proof of am I tapping into that treasure? Do I have that, right? Sometimes we have this misconception that the proof that we have the treasure, uh, that that we're, 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 we're utilizing the treasure that God has given us is because all the provisions that God gives us, all the blessings that we have. If you recall, there was a group of people that followed Jesus Christ for some time and they followed him and God blessed them and broke bread and blessed it and he fed over 5,000 people. 
And those people continued to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there came to a point where they kept following him. And he looks around and says, hey, what are you following me for? Right? And he says, listen, there ain't no more bread here. And they started one by one just peeling off and going the opposite direction. They said, oh, well, if the provision's not here, then I see no more value in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? So sometimes we think that as long as everything's going good and we get everything that we want, then that shows me that I have the treasure, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the treasure of the Lord Jesus Christ has no bearing on what you have and what you don't have. You understand? It's not about what, what, it's not about what Jesus Christ is giving you, which is the evidence that you're walking and you're, all, and, and you're walking in the Spirit and you have all the fruits of the Spirit and you're tapping in all this treasure of the Lord Jesus Christ inside of you. I would remind you that it's not an emotion. And I know, listen, listen, we're emotional creatures. I'm an emotional creature. And sometimes we get up in the heat of it and we think that the way that we know that we have this treasure and we're locked in is because there was some kind of emotion that gendered up inside of me and I, was, and I felt a certain way. And, and that's the evidence that, guess what? Ah, oh, man, the Lord is with me. Let me ask you this. Emotions change pretty quick, don't they? So let me ask you, if your emotions tend to change, does that mean that you're no longer in the, rolling in the dough? <laughs> does that mean that the Lord Jesus Christ is no longer of any value to you? Well, it's not hindered on your emotions. How about this? It's not, it's not in a person or a place. Listen, I love youth camp. Uh, youth camp has been such a blessing. I count it a privilege to be able to be a part of a ministry like this. And undoubtedly, some of you, you've been in here, you've been coming to this camp for years now. And some of you are now counselors. And I just think it's wonderful. The Lord has, has blessed this thing. But can I tell you this? The evidence of whether or not you have the treasure in earth and vessel is not because you're at youth camp. There's nothing special about this place in the sense that it's just because you're here that you've got some special corner of the market. And just because a relationship is working out or doesn't work out or certain things or certain people are around, that has no bearing on it whatsoever. That's not proof of the treasure. You say, what's a proof of the treasure? The Bible tells us, if you will look with me in verse number 6, he tells you what the treasure is. Obviously, we understand that we have this treasure in earth and vessel. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. But he gives us more detail at the end of verse number 6. He says... <clears throat> Excuse me, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Whether or not I have proof that I, am, that I have the treasure that's in earthen vessel is the fact that I know some things. There's some things that God shows me. There's some things that I understand. And there's, guess what? You're not going to know those things outside of your Bible. That's why we come into church. That's why we go to Sunday school. That's why we get in the Word of God. That's why we're called Bible believers. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. How about this? Knowing that you have confidence in death, that is a great treasure. These are things that, that no matter what happens to you in your life, they have no bearing on this treasure. Confidence in death. Listen, I don't care how bad your life gets. Someday when you close your eyes in death, if you're saved, you're going to wind up in heaven. Hey, knowing that, that's of great value. That's of great value. How about this? That Jesus Christ cares about my life. Even when I don't think anybody else cares about me. I don't think my friends care about me. My parents don't care about me. My preacher doesn't care about me. All the people around me don't care about me. Can I tell you this? It's a real value to know that the Lord Jesus Christ cares about you tonight. How about this? He can comfort me when I'm, when I'm sad. He can comfort me when I'm down. He can carry me when I'm weak. When I don't think I can go any further, I know the Lord Jesus Christ can carry me. How about this? He can correct me when I'm wrong. The Bible tells me that. He's going to correct every son whom he receives. That's something that I know that I can, I can put my, my hat on because the Word of God tells me that. That's of great value. I know that no matter where I am or what I'm doing, he's, I'm constantly in his presence. He sees me. I'm not talking about the fellowship. I'm saying he'll never leave me nor forsake me. 
I'm never by myself, no matter how alone I feel. That's great value. Amen. And I hope, I hope that you can tap into those things. That's the whole purpose of what we're talking about. But I can tell you, what we all see in this passage here is the perception of the treasure. We have a lot of different people here. All different walks of life, all different kinds of uh, backgrounds and backstories. And it shows us a couple different ways people view it. If you will, look in verse number three. There's those who don't see it at all. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You want to know what I know? Is that, I don't know if, who else in here is lost, but I know this. The natural man receives not the things of God, neither can he know them. They're, they're foolishness unto him, because he's spiritually discerned. And you want to, there's, some, there's some, uh, some of you in here maybe, you don't know where you're going when you die. You've been in church for five minutes or haven't even been to church. You don't even really know how you got here. Some of you have been in church your whole lives, right? But I know this, if you're not saved, you're not going to see any value in Jesus Christ at all. You know, there's a saying that says one's, one man's trash is another man's treasure. You know? Some people say, I don't need Jesus Christ. He's not going to offer me nothing. He ain't going to tell me nothing I don't know. And I just keep going on the way I'm going to go. And I don't care. I don't need Jesus Christ. Okay, well, you don't see the treasure. You don't see the value in him at all. There could be somebody in here like that. How about this one? There could, you, could be, you could misunderstand it. If you look back in verse 1, he said, the, the way that it starts out, it says, therefore... And we all know that in Bible study of the word therefore, we have to ask ourselves, what is it there for, right? And so we, it's, it's saying something that preceded it or something that came before it. It's going to shine some light on that. So because of what happened before this, this is why he's, he's uh, starting to talk in chapter number four. The illustration that he gives is of Moses. And when he was up on the mountain and his face started to shine and he comes down off of that mountain, if you remember the illustration, you remember the story, those people come to Moses and they say, Moses, your face is shining. Cover it up. We don't want to see it. They, didn't, they were so carnally minded that they could not see the spiritual implication of what happened to Moses. They couldn't see that he had just been with God and that God had so, uh, had so shone on him that it was glowing on his face. And they said, cover up, Moses. We, don't, we, 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 we can't understand that. And so they're so carnally minded, just like sometimes we seem to think that this treasure that the Lord has for us, this treasure in earth and vessels, that somehow we can obtain it by carnal means. I can see them looking at Moses and they're saying, oh man, I, I, yeah, Moses, we're, we're happy that your face is shining, but that, that's a pretty steep mountain you just climbed to get that, and I don't really think that I'm up for the, the, uh, the hike. Right? They're looking at that. Look at what it says in verse number uh, 17. It says, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. They didn't see no liberty. <laughs> They saw, they saw a list of do's and don'ts, and they saw a list of things that they can't obtain to, and, oh, it's all the flesh, and don't you know, uh, you just say, I can't do this, and I can't do that, and it's just a list of things that you don't want me to do, and, you know, you're just holding me back from a good time, and that's a pretty high mountain. I don't want to climb that mountain to get close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I say that? If you think, if you think that obtaining this treasure in earth and vessels is somehow obtained, by your amount of consecration or your, or your amount of separation or the things that you do and don't do, that's not how you obtain it. I would say you're misunderstood. You maybe don't have an understanding of what exactly we're talking about here. If you remember in the video, the, the, the quotation was, separation doesn't produce elevation. Elevation naturally produces separation. And so if you're constantly focusing on the things that you can and can't do and all this different stuff, don't you know that the Spirit of the Lord brings liberty? And it's liberty because you know the boundaries of what the Word of God tells us, and in those boundaries you have 100% liberty. But sometimes we get so focused on the boundaries, we say, oh, well, he's just trying to keep me back from that and trying to keep me back from that and trying to keep me back from that. You're just putting me in a harness. And so we say, well... It's not so much worth the shine on my face. I'll just kind of stay down here, and just as long as Moses keeps his face covered up, I won't be under conviction, and I'll just live my life the way I want to live it. Have a form of godliness, but no power. Sometimes you can misunderstand it. But I know this as far as 
I know some of you, if you look through verses 8 through 10, you know what you find? You find a group of people in the passage who are troubled and a group of people who are perplexed and a group of people who are persecuted and cast down, the Bible says. And you know what they are? They're searching for something, man. They're searching for something. They're saying, man, Lord, we, we're, we're, we're pressed down. We've got all kinds of issues, and we need you, Lord. We need that treasure. We need that value. We need, we need an inflow of cash, Lord. Help us. And I know this. Some of you in here, you have overcome great odds to even be here this week. Some of you in here, guess what? You're perplexed and you're cast down and you've got home problems and you've got, you've got uh, personal problems and you've got family problems, you've got parent problems or brother and sister problems, relationship problems. Listen, I'm not going to make fun of the issues that you're facing, nor am I going to belittle them just because you're younger. I'll say this, if you're searching, he likes to be found. There's a group of people here and they're searching for something. I hope that's some of you in here today. There could be all three of these present. There could be some that you don't see the value of it. You say, I'm going to just take a nap. I'm just here to have a good time. Maybe that's the case. Maybe some of you in here, you come in and you think, oh, well, I just thought it was this. Maybe you're going to get that epiphany moment and say, well, it's not what I thought it was. You start hearing the preaching and start seeing the teaching and all this different stuff. And you go, well, maybe I, maybe I kind of had this thing pinned wrong. Maybe I had a misconception of what this thing was, this Christian life. And then there's some of you in here, you've been in it long enough, and you know what you're doing? You're holding on for dear life, and you come to youth camp, and you're just sitting there going, man, I just need something, God. I really need something. Can I give you a couple things real, real quick before we give it over to the preacher? We have a, we'll have a special after. Before we hand it off, can I give you three things in the passage that might help you as you embark on this this week? It's going to take some commitment on your behalf because we see that in order to procure, to procure or to get or to find this treasure it may not it's not just going to be as easy as following a map and boom there it is if you will look in verse number one he tells you what to expect look in verse number one he says we faint not he says it again in verse number 16 with some more light on on the subject he says for which cause we faint not why because it's hard it's not easy. And he goes on to say, he goes on to say that, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. We know that it takes a level of commitment because there's nothing that is of great value that doesn't first come with commitment. If you recall Naboth, he has a vineyard and it's very precious in his sight, so precious that it's also precious to, uh, to uh, Ahab the king. So much, so precious that he was willing to give his very life because he wasn't willing to sell what God had given him. Why did, he ha why did it have so much value to him? Because it was passed down from his fathers to his fathers to his fathers all the way down to him. And there was blood and there was sweat and there was tears and there was commitment. And it was when the sun was, was shining, they were out there sweating to death, pulling weeds and plucking everything off while they're on their hands and knees. While they're out there tending to the fields and tending to the, to the, to the animals. Five o'clock in the morning getting up and doing the same thing every single day, every single day. That when the world came and said, hey, I would like what you have. He said, no, sir, it's way too valuable for you to have. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to find something this week. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take some commitment on your part. It's going to, listen, you're going to have to realize that it's not as easy as you may think it is. It's not supposed to be easy. Anybody in here ever try to clean a really, really dirty room? Some of you are like, no, I have the perfect room. It's wonderful. Right? You ever walk into a room, it's so bad, and you're just like, I have no idea where to start. And you're just like overwhelmed, and you're looking at it, and you're like, oh, i got to go to the bathroom. And you go to the bathroom, and you come back, and you're like, oh, i got to go to the bathroom again. So I'm going to go to the bathroom again. And, and you only go to the bathroom so many times before you realize you're facing this really, really messy room. And guess what? You can try to power clean it and just shove stuff under the bed and like put stuff in the, the, every dresser drawer and your parents come in, open up the dresser and they're like, why is there notebooks and stuff and socks and everything all in one drawer? I don't understand. What is going on? I cleaned my room. No, you didn't. You just shoved a bunch of stuff in every crevice that you had, right? You want to know what it takes to clean up a dirty room? 
you got to come in and say, man, this room is absolutely filthy. And you have to take it all in. you got to say, you know what? I am going to take the time that is required to go through every drawer and under every nook and cranny and put everything where it's supposed to be. And that's going to take a lot of effort on your part. And know this, that it's going to take a lot longer than just five days at camp. It's going to take you going back home and knowing that what he just said in the, in the passage, that it's a day by day day. There is no discharge in that war. It doesn't get any easier no matter how old you get. It doesn't matter what you obtain or what you end up getting. Gentlemen and ladies, it's not going to get easier. The minute you get that thing that you think, oh, as soon as I get that, then it'll be easier. Guess what? Something else will pop up and it ain't going to be any easier. You know what you're going to have to do? You're just going to have to commit to the totality of the situation in which you're in. Just embrace it. It's my flesh. It ain't going anywhere. Okay, so what do you do then? Look in verse number two. I'm almost done. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. You need commitment, but you know what you need to do? You need to be honest. You know what we're asking you this week? You know what I'm asking you? I'll ask you right now. First sermon, get it out of the way. You want to know what I'm asking you? I'm asking you to be honest. I'm asking you to first off be honest with yourself. Forget everybody else you came with. Forget everybody else, your parents, ever. Listen, you're secluded, you're by yourself here. We got you, you're kind of trapped. <laughs> be honest with yourself. How you doing? How about this, be honest with the Lord. You know what he says? He says, have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Why don't you be honest? You know what? When you're honest, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to renounce some things. You know what, Lord? I've been pretty dishonest. I've been crafty. I've been sleight of hand. I've been, I've been, I know what the Bible says, but I've been deceitful in how I've been applying it and how I've been doing it. And I'm trying to hide things from mom and I'm trying to hide things from dad and I'm hiding things from the preacher and I'm just doing my own thing. And you know what? I, I live a certain way this way and I have another life this way. Listen, this is what produces a double life. And it happens a lot with you folks and in us folks. <laughs> I remember what it was like being a teenager, having you preach youth Sunday and you're out partying on the sink on Saturday night. I remember that. And you want to know something? You may be able to fool me, and you may be able to fool your parents, and you may be able to fool your preachers and your youth directors and all that stuff, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot fool God. He knows. And I'm just going to urge you, if you want to find something this week, could you just for a second stop playing the games and just be honest? Just level up. Say, Lord been a little bit crafty. been telling myself a lie to justify what I want to do. And last thing, what's the last part of that verse say? He says, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Could you be open? When God gives you the opportunity, when God rings your bell this week, would you be willing to take that truth now that we're being honest? Take that truth that God reveals to you and those things God pings on you. I don't know what they are. I'm not going to give you a list. You know what they are. Would you be willing to start being open before the Lord? He says manifestation of the truth. You know what you do? You come down to an altar and you open it up and you say, Okay, Lord, here's the truth. I've been deceitful. and I've been I'm a mess, Lord, and done this and I've got this and you see it I see it nobody else sees it but you see it and I see it and you know what you do you lift it as high up as you can possibly get it and you put it fully in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and say there it is will you help me I need some treasure I'm not looking for the easy way out I'm not looking for a quick fix I'm being honest Lord and I'm being open Look at it. It's dirty. It's filthy. It shouldn't be there. I know it shouldn't be there. But will you please help me with this? 
will you please help me with this? I'm telling you, the Lord Jesus Christ, He values when you acknowledge the truth about yourself. And if He values you when you, when you uh, acknowledge the truth about yourself, you want to know, He may give you some value and some virtue when you finally get honest with Him. And that's the encouragement for this week as we start out. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. I want to thank you, Lord, for this group of folks that have been here. Father, I pray that you'd help us this week as we listen to preaching, as we hear teaching. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be committed. Help us to be honest. And God, help us to be open and not playing any games. Father, I pray that you'd have the preeminence now. In Jesus' name, amen.